see all of you here, and to those of you who are watching us online, on live stream, thank you for joining us. We are at Valley Church at uh, 1160 Lane Valley Road, North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, North America, the planet Earth. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is that my prayer is that at some point in time, you will be joining us here at church for an in-person service. Because it's totally different when you are in person and uh, when you're just watching us online. You can see me, but I can see you. So, I'd like to invite you. You know, the uh, slogan of Valley Church is, there's always a place for you. So, we'd like to invite you to come one time, by God's time, joining us. Sunday after Sunday, my brothers and sisters, we come to church and enjoy the fellowship, enjoy the love that we have here. We're so happy we come and feel everybody saying hello once a week. We come to church. But you know, one thing that I actually think that is more important for us is that while you're there seated, what goes into your mind and what goes into your heart? Two things. What goes into your mind and what's go, what goes into your heart? Sometimes, when we come here, the nice thing to do is not forget the world behind us. Just soak it in. You know, we just uh, finished a worship service. Have you felt something in your heart while singing the songs? Have you felt anything? What goes into your mind? You know, that is an important thing. I think, for all intents and purposes, when we come to church, we must have an objective. Have you ever realized that sometimes after church, Monday comes, and somebody asks you, okay, what's the message of the church yesterday? And all of a sudden, everything's blank. You can't say anything, but you're here for almost two hours. Right? Now, what, what, what I'd like us to feel is that uh, try to summarize it in one word. So, for instance, if the message was about forgiveness, remember that word, forgiveness. And then keep repeating it, forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. I tell you, when you get out into the world, you will remember everything that the pastor may have said, okay, because of that simple word, forgiveness. So, the objective being is that when we leave church, okay, what word will I carry on today? And remember that. Okay? Now, have you ever experienced that one time, somehow, as you're listening to the Word of God, it seems like it's talking about exactly what you're going through right now. It's like the message is focused on you, and you're actually, you're actually feeling that it's, it's you that the pastor is talking about. I can tell you, and I can assure you, that Pastor Marcel did not research your life just to be able to talk about you here. No, he didn't. Okay? Accept that this is the Holy Spirit talking to you. And embrace it. Okay? So, what, what, am, I, what am I asking you to do? Two things. In the book of Hebrews, three times it was mentioned. Chapter 3, 8 and 15, and chapter 4, verse 15. If you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Three times. If you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Let it in. Feel it. If you feel that it is touching your hearts right now, like the blood that runs through your veins to the arteries of your heart, soak in it. So, what am I asking you to do? Have a teachable heart. Keep your hearts always teachable. Because that's what God wants us to do. To feel Him. Now, experiencing the message. Let's experience it. It's not just, you know, there's a big difference between a lecture or a concert performance. In a lecture, you gain head knowledge. In a performance, 
you were entertained. But in the Word of God, you make life-changing decisions. It's not just being entertained. It's not just knowing what has been said. It is trying to soak it in and then ask the question, what changes will I ask God to make in me, in my life, so I could align myself with the word that was just stated? What changes will I ask God? Not what changes can I do? You cannot do it. Unless you ask the Lord, it will never happen to you. Ask the Lord, Lord, with this message that you have just given me today, these are the areas in my life that I want you to change. These are the areas in my life that I want you to focus on that I may change. You know, when, uh, when David gave his son Solomon the charge, he said, Know the God of your heart. Know the God of your father. And serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For our Lord searches all hearts, all our hearts, and understands every thought and every plan. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come now entirely dependent upon the work of your Holy Spirit that you may open our eyes, fill our minds, and our hearts with the truth of your word. Grant us the grace and wisdom in order that we might receive your word, depend on it, and rest in it. Accomplish your purposes upon us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I shall not be with him much longer. He will look for me, but where I am going, he cannot come. I shall not follow you wherever you go. I will lay down my life for you. Peter, this very night before the cock crows twice, you would have denied three times that you even know me. Never. I will never deny you. You will all lose me. Shepherd Trump is struck and sheep will be scattered. Even if all who faith, I will not. I... I have prayed for you. And once you have recovered, you in your turn must be strength to your brothers. Sending him to Pontius Pilate. <laughs> we know how that ends up, too. Wait a minute. I know you. 
You will get that Jesus. Yo, one of his followers. No, I don't know him. But he is. Look. And I don't know him. He is one of his followers. He's a friend of Jesus, a disciple. Don't let him go. Mistaken. I know that. No, this Jesus they speak of, no, I believe that. Go. Just keep quiet here. Don't you know you're going to take this down? A lie, for whatever reason it is said, is a denial that we know Jesus. Lying is an original sin in this world. It was the same scheme that the devil used in seducing Eve to eat of that forbidden fruit. A lie is a lie is a lie, whose its only objective is to be able to deceive and to withhold the truth. Now, the Bible tells us that the devil is the father of lies. Satan is the father of lies. And it's only, his only objective is to be able to destroy and to kill. To deceive, to destroy, and to kill. But why do we lie? Let's try to decipher the film. What do you think are the reasons that Peter has? That's why he lied. He lied because he doesn't want to be perceived as associated with Jesus. You know, as Christians, there are times in, our, in this world when it's so difficult for us to be known as a Christian. Sometimes we try to withhold that truth that we are Christians. He lied because he was afraid of the consequences of that they will do to him. In a lot of ways, we also lied because of something that might happen to us. We think of the consequences. What will happen to me if I lie? Or if I, if I will not, if I will tell the truth? He lied because of the pressure around him from the people. This is very easy. You're surrounded by people who believe differently. And just to be in, we lie. He lied because of his yet unsure trust in Jesus. Sometimes, when we are faced with trials, we're not sure. That's why in ourselves and in our hearts, we feel that maybe it's not. He lied because of a weak faith in Christ. He lied because at that very moment, that is the best thing to do. That is the right thing to do, to save himself. Isn't it similar? Sometimes we do lie just to be able to protect ourselves. He lied because he was all alone, helpless, and fearful. Now, can we picture ourselves in the reasons that we have given on why Peter lied? How many of you here have never lied in their life? If you say yes, that's a lie. Today, we will talk about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. How many of you here have experienced being a witness in a court of law? You know, when, you're, when, you, when you become a witness in a court of law, you are there 
they put you on a stand, and then you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I remember when I was working in a bank in Manila, I was an account verifier, and I was tasked by the uh, uh, manager of the uh, bank to be a witness in a court case involving accounts. But before I go in, the manager told me, every statement that you make always begin with our record shows. That's the starting statement that I have. Our record shows. So for every question that I was asked by that uh, uh, lawyer, my response would always be, our record shows, our record shows, because there is a foundational truth, there is a proof of reference that I could start with. So I always have to mention that. Our record shows. Now we too, as Christians, are called to be witnesses. In Acts 1 verse 8, it says, But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. However, in contrast with a witness in a court of law, there is something different between Christians becoming witnesses. We differ on two things. One, we are called not only to tell the truth, but also to live the truth. That's a big difference. We are not only there to tell what is true, but also to live it. But before we could live it, before we could live the truth, we must know it, we must accept it, and have every being of our fiber, every fiber of our being, live through it. Number two, whenever we become a witness, I'd like to tell you that wherever you are is a witness stand. Whether you're in the workplace, whether you're in the family, whether you are anywhere else, that is your witness stand. And our testifying never ends. We always have to testify to the truth. But still, the best testimony of all is the way we live our lives. Always the best. Because people can see you. People look at you. And whatever they see in you speaks volumes of what a Christian should be. Now, truth is an essential character of God. By His almighty power, God can do anything. But the Bible tells us that there is one thing that God cannot do. It is impossible for God to lie. Because lying is not among his character. So let us define the truth and start by knowing what it is not. Truth is not simply whatever works. You know, lies can also work, can appear to work, but they are still lies. In my profession, there is a lot of temptation to lie. I sell cars, the uh, second most untrusted profession. I will not say the first one because some people might get hurt. So, But then again, especially when you're selling a used car, okay, it is imperative, important for you to tell the history of the vehicle. Whether it's been engaged or involved in an accident, how much was the accident and so on. I learned very quickly when I was starting in the, in, the, in the business that people sell cars because they withhold that information. And I can tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, I lost a lot of deals because I have to tell them everything. But it just gives me peace to be able to tell. I, there were times when I will tell a customer one thing to buy a car, and I will tell them, please, don't buy it. Because it will not give me a good 
feeling, you bought the car and then you come back to me, and then you're saying that there is something wrong in it. It's always the truth, but the truth will always be fine. I tell you, truth is not what is generally or collectively agreed upon. You know, in this world, people will gather together and form a conspiracy and tell something, decide that this is what is right and what is true, and then declares it, even if it is a lie. They all agree to pursue the same beliefs, tell their story, but it does not make a truthful declaration. Truth is not same, simply what makes people feel good. Just to prevent an argument or bring them to your side, even by news, painful as they may seem, and uncomfortable can be true. Let's just be honest about it. I'm talking to all the husbands here. You saw your wife trying a new dress in front of the mirror. And then she asked the question, do I look fat in this dress? How would you respond? You know, sometimes wives ask questions that are very difficult. How would you respond? Okay? Now, I'd like to tell you, the question is answerable by yes or no. Do I look fat in this dress? But your wife doesn't expect, or maybe anyone else doesn't expect an answer which is simply no or simply yes. Wives want an opinion, not just an answer to the question. You know, I was thinking about this very carefully. If it was me and my wife, and she asked the question, do I look fat in this dress? Of course, what I will say is that, oh, that's a nice one. You fit perfectly well. And then she will ask that, but uh, what, what do you think? Do I look fat? And I like the color too. It's so nice. Yeah. But you know, I feel fat. This mirror, I think, makes me feel fat uh, on this dress. I think I will stop eating for a while. No, wait, 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 wait. It could be the mirror. That will be my reason. It could be the mirror. We'll go to Ikea tomorrow. We'll change that mirror. Can we eat now? And then my wife will say, perhaps, but you know, I think I really look fat on this dress. And I will say, look, listen. Whatever you look, whatever dress you wear, Okay. You will always look perfect for me. Okay? And I will always love you forever and ever. Amen. And then my wife will tell me, Really? Absolutely. Come here. And I will give her a big hug and softly whisper on her ear, Can we eat now? What did I do? One, I, will, I tell myself that I did not lie. That's one thing that I have, that I will tell myself. Number two, as in Thessalonians, I have encouraged her and I have lift, lifted her up. That's number two. Number three, I was able to reassure her of my love, whatever happens. And of course, more importantly, I was able to prevent a potential starvation. Truth is also not defined by what you intend to achieve. Sometimes our best intentions are marred by a compromise of the truth. Truth is not simply what we believe. A lie believed to be truth repeatedly is now perceived to be true. So again, let's ask the question, so what is the truth? Pastor and author John MacArthur says, Biblical truth is all about truth. Biblical Christianity is all about truth. If you're a Christian, then your being a Christian must be based 
on the Bible alone. Nothing else. You know, God wrote only one book, the Bible. And it contains all the truth God intended for us, so that our spiritual lives may be in order. He even tells us that you need not consult any other book, just the Bible. The Word of God, the Bible, contains not only the whole truth, but it is also the highest standard of truth. The rule by which all truths must be measured. Now, I hope you can take this to her. If you are a Christian, our truth is not subject to change or amendment. Our truth is not voided by whatever changes there may be in world opinions or what they now call political correctness. The Christian truth need not be revised to adapt or redefined to conform with every new generation. Changing times do not change the truth because the scripture is unchanging as God himself. What we have as Christians is the same truth that Abraham, Moses, David, and all the apostles had. It is the same. This is the foundational truth. Solid and firm that we should not reinvent it to suit the times which we live in. There will come a time and I think it is now happening, when the world will do everything to bend the truth. But one thing is certain, our understanding of the truth can be refined and sharpened by our constant study of the Scriptures. If we know the truth of the Word of God, then we will not be swayed by whatever happens in this world. My friends, this is our opening statement. This is our record shows. So every time you are faced with something that you feel is not in the Word of God, then our record shows never even attempt to debate with other religions without having a common reference. First Peter chapter 1 verse 25. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Long after we're gone in this earthly life, even when there are already flying cars or people in Mars, my friends, brothers and sisters, the truth of the word of God remains forever for all generations to live by. We therefore need to bring and align our understanding of the truth to the truth of God's Word. No one, but no one, should manipulate the Scriptures in an effort to design and harmonize it with the unstable and changing opinions of this world. Remember this, clarity is of God, confusion is of the devil. As Christians, the biblical truth is everything to us. Governments may change constitutions or the law of the land, but biblical truth is constant, perpetually stable, and eternally unfading. Now, why is it so important for us to understand the concept of biblical truth in all areas of our lives? I want you to look at me directly. Life has consequences when we lie. Especially in our relationships. We hurt people. We break their trust. We break their hearts. And eventually, so many suffer 
every time we do not embrace the truth of the Word of God. Need I say more? Only the devil is happy whenever relationships are broken. And do you know what the ultimate objective of the devil? The ultimate objective is to destroy or put a doubt, even a bit, on our salvation in Christ. Now, I will be honest to tell you, for those of you especially who are not yet, who do not have that relationship with the Lord Jesus, I would rather believe that there is Jesus Christ who saved me, who forgave me of all my sins, and who promised me a place in heaven. And when I die, there is none. Rather than not to believe in Him today, and when I die, there is that heavenly kingdom. And there is also that hell where I am going because of my irresponsible disbelief in Him. You know, as Christians, we were commissioned in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, therefore make, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Our role is only to witness and become the best witness we will always be in a truthful manner. Now, just a word of caution. Remember this. When you witness to somebody, you don't decide who goes to heaven or not. Your role, our role, is only to witness. Only Jesus decides. Therefore, we are not to judge whatever the circumstances may be or even speculate that the outcome or the result of our witnessing. No one should say, I failed to save her. No one should say that. You know, even Billy Graham, in one of his sermons, he said, he doesn't claim that he alone led anyone to Christ. For he could only be a small part of that person accepting Jesus as his Savior. It could have been a mother or a daughter's prayer. It could have been someone's word or encouragement. It could have been the last minute that person felt in himself that I love you, Lord, and I accept you to be my Savior. So the judgment of whether we're going, that person is going to heaven or not, doesn't lie upon us, nor a jury of witnesses. Only Jesus saves. And he will be the only judge of that. As witnesses, we only proclaim what is true according to the Scriptures. And we share this truth with our minds and with our hearts, conforming to the veracity of what we declare. Then leave it to the court of Jesus to decide. God's desire is that no one should perish. Now let's talk about this. Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. The whole armor of God. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole, the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to witness, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Now listen. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and as shoes for your feet have been put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, and I may be declared boldly, as I ought to speak. Let me... Uh, get away first from that point. Do you know what happens in a vehicular accident? In a vehicular accident, there are three impacts. One is the impact of the vehicle over another vehicle or a, sta or a, uh, a stationary object. Impact number one. Now, while most modern cars right now already have the safety features, when you hit something, the engine goes down, and then the front of the vehicle has this, like, accordion, okay, that folds to prevent the passenger from getting all of that kinetic energy, that force that will hit them. That is impact number one, vehicular impact, vehicular collision. Impact number two is the human collision or the body impact. When that happens, you have to understand that the body is in the same motion as the speed of the vehicle. So, when that happens, okay, your body now is either pushed forward to hit anything in front, the windshield or the dashboard, okay, that is impact number two, the human impact, the body impact, vehicular impact, human impact. But the third impact, which is more likely what causes the fatal uh, occurrence, is what you call the organ impact. In that instance, your bodily organ hit something. Your brain will hit the skull. Your heart will hit the ribs, your spleen, and all that, the spleen, you know, the spleen, the liver, they're always static. But in a case of an impact like that, it may bleed, which causes internal bleeding. So those are three impacts, which you have to understand. That's why in a vehicular accident, do not just tell me, you know what, I'm okay. No, you're not. You have to be sure that the organs of your body really are in good term, uh, uh, in good stead. Now, why am I saying this? You know, in 1959, Nils Bolling, who is an engineer of Volvo, invented the three-point seatbelt. They patented it, but then they opened the patent so that other manufacturers can use that seatbelt. Okay. Now, by the same token, I'd like to tell you that in the Word of God, Paul started with the belt of truth. You know, when, when he was writing this, he may be looking at the Roman, the Roman soldier. You know, the Roman soldier carries or wears a lot of armor. The belt of that Roman soldier is the one that carries the scabbard and the sword. It is that belt that holds everything together. Now, in the word of God, Paul said, stand therefore having fastened the belt of truth, because the belt of truth Truth is the foundation of that armor. Truth is the foundation of everything that carries us to be able to parry the enemy, to have that armor against the enemy. Now, coupled with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, then we could be protecting ourselves from what the devil has been throwing to us. So, what, what am I saying? Buckle up using God's Word. The same is true in our spiritual journey through life. If we fasten the belt of truth and arm ourselves with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, then we are equipped with all the safety features that can absorb the kinetic energy of sin. But it must begin with the truth. 
When you board a plane, the steward will tell you or will ask you to make sure that your seat belt is fastened low and tight across your lap to prepare you for any turbulence along the way. My friends, life has many turbulence along the way. And the belt of truth fastened tightly across our being from the way we think to the way we speak, feel, act, and carry ourselves every day. For every breath you take, the word of truth will allow us to overcome the turbulences or temptations in life. We need to remember His promise that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And whatever lies the enemy brings into our minds, there is a corresponding truth so powerful to counter that in the Word of God. Next thing, please. Is this the man you think so dangerous? This, the man that aspires to be a king. Come, 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 come. Now, the leaders of the Senate have been accused you of teaching perverted doctrine. Come. They also say you call yourself the king of the Jews. Where are you, king of the Jews? This world, my followers would have fought to prevent me from being captured. Oh, you speak of a kingdom. Therefore, you must be a king. Are you a king? I was born for one purpose. Pilate asked, what is the truth? Not realizing that he is there, face to face, is standing in front of the origin of truth. Jesus is the personification of truth. God incarnate, God made flesh. Truth personified. You know, Jesus knows Pilate and knows what's in his heart. At that very moment, he knows what Pilate feels and what Pilate wants to do. But there is something that's stopping Pilate from doing on what he feels is right. What kept Pilate from seeing the truth in Jesus? One, it was his pride. Like all of us sometimes have. Because of our pride, we sometimes forgo with the truth. It was his power. When we are in a position, sometimes our power doesn't allow us or prevents us from saying the truth. It was his fear, which he was controlled by the Sanhedrin. You know, at the beginning, we relate ourselves with Peter, who lied because he does not have the power and strength to tell the truth. Now, we align ourselves with Pilate, who has the power, but still has not seen the truth, because of his desire to cling to that power, and his fear of repercussions. 
Now, let me ask you, who is on trial here? I tell you, it's not Jesus who's on trial here. It's Pilate, the Pharisees, and those around are the ones on trial at the very moment that they are faced with the truth. Like every time we face temptations. Every time we are tempted to lie, we are on trial. Shall we abide by the truth of the gospel, or shall we deny the truth, thereby denying Jesus in what we are about to do? Jesus is the personification of truth. John 8, 31, 32 says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now what does it mean to know the truth? To abide in my word means to believe and be faithful to Christ's teachings. This, Jesus said, is the mark of a true disciple. And by his teachings for us today and for generations past, present, and future. His teachings, the word of God, as contained in the scriptures, is the truth. And then you will know the truth. No, does not only mean to understand his teachings with the mind or intellect, nor to simply memorize the verses and be able to memorize it at some point in time. No. His teachings for us today, okay, this is simply, even in our daily life, we can know that something is bad for us when faced with temptation. But sometimes we continue to do it. To know the truth is to experience it. If you take Jesus at his word and live the truth, that in his name we could practice the truth that comes from him in our life, then we throw all the old self, when we come to him. This is our context of knowing the truth. To experience Jesus by accepting his teachings. Now when Jesus said, you will know the truth and truth will set you free, he was saying that our obedience to God alone is the only way we will experience the truth and liberation from sin. All of us want freedom in its fullest sense, not just physical freedom. Sometimes we are enslaved to some habits that continue happening, a recurring sin in our life. We want to stop it, but we can't. And it always comes in, and every time it comes in, we indulge in it, and then ask for forgiveness from the Lord, and then it happens again. We want to be free from that. We know it is wrong, and yet our, our conscience dictates that it is a sin also. We do not know how to stop. And this has caused us to be bonded into it, now a slave to that. John 8, 36. So if the Son sets, free, sets you free, you will be free indeed. When a person is deprived of freedom physically, the burden of slavery or bondage is easily sin. But when you are, when your soul is in captivity, that's a different story. Now let me tell you this. Pardon, the word pardon must be offered, it must be delivered, and it must be accepted. You know, there is this strange story of George Wilson about 200 years ago, a man named George Wilson was sentenced to be hanged for robbing the United States males and for murder. Andrew Jackson, who was then the president, exercised his prerogative and sent Wilson a pardon. Wilson, however, refused the pardon and insisted that it was not a pardon unless he accepted it. The Attorney General said that the law was silent on this point and the matter was referred to the United States Supreme Court Chief Justice George Marshall, Justice Marshall gave the following decision. A pardon is a paper, the value of which depends on its acceptance by the person implicated. It is hardly to be supposed 
that one under sentence of death would refuse to accept a pardon. But if it is refused, then it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. Jesus offers us the pardon. We, as witnesses, deliver that pardon to this world, hoping and expecting that this world will accept the pardon. That is our role as witnesses. We deliver the pardon that Jesus Christ wants to give to this world, hoping that everyone should not perish and will accept that pardon. I'd like to call the worship team, please. To be free indeed is a, is a condition where all of us, whose body and soul have been condemned by sin to death and eternal damnation in hell, turns and accepts the pardon offered by Jesus Christ to become a child of God and live by the word of God forever. Let me put it this way. The Bible tells us that everyone will have eternal life. All of us will have eternal life. The only question is, where? Shall we have eternal life in a place where there is everlasting joy? Or shall we have eternal life in a place where there is suffering, nothing of this? Your choice. God gives us that choice. So for those of you watching and listening right now, who do not yet have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And for those of you, up until today, are still asking the question, am I really saved? Am I really a child of God? Because of the recurring sin in your life, because of the constant lying that we continue to do. I want to take this moment to talk to you. The most profound pardon is what Jesus Christ is offering to humanity. A pardon for all sins we have committed, continue to commit, and about to commit. The Lord Jesus stands always ready to forgive, ready to forgive. Today, as a witness of the Lord Jesus, I am delivering that pardon to you. And I pray that you will accept it. Jesus loves you. He cares for you. Sacrificed for you. Even died for you. He wants to give you that freedom from the sins of the world. He wants you to receive His blessed assurance and offer you pardon and forgiveness for all your sins. I will ask everyone here today just to bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's do it now. Bow your heads, just close your eyes. If you feel you are the person who wants to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior now, if you feel that there is still that doubt whether your Christianity is based on the truth of the Word of God, take a step. I want you to raise your hand. Just raise your hand while all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed. It is now between you and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, Revelation said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and meet with him and he with me. If you are that person and if you feel in your heart that you want to have that blessed assurance, just raise your hand. And I want you to pray this prayer for me. Not for me, 
I want you to I want to lead you in a prayer. You can repeat the words, but I need you to make it your own words and tell it to the Lord Jesus. Don't just think it in your mind. Say it with your lips and feel it in your heart. For it is there where all relationships are born. Pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come in your presence today and I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I continue to sin with my lying lips. And I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, I have lived a lie in my life that only you can change. And I come to you today because I believe that you died on the cross for me as a penalty for my sins. And you rose from the dead. By your grace, Lord Jesus, I ask now that you come into my life. And I want to trust and follow you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. I now commit my life to you and grant you full control. Transform me, Lord, to be the kind of person that you want me to be. Truthful in your word and in my life.